the recording. All righty. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Jean, I'm part of the Education Abroad team here at Texas Global. Um, welcome to the CNS Education Abroad presentation. Um, this presentation is going to focus on international programs that might be a good fit for different CNS majors. And we're going to be talking about internships and exchange programs, affiliate programs, and faculty led programs. Um, first, let me just do a quick intro. Um, we've got some Texas Global colleagues uh, today that are presenting. Um, we've got Kate, if you want to do a quick wave, and we've got Joshua as well. Hello. And we also have uh, some wonderful, oh, sorry. <laughs> We've also got some wonderful CNS faculty um, with us. We've got uh, Dr. Hansen and Buskirk. We've got Dr. Sata and uh, Dr. Phelps. Um, I don't know if he's on yet. Um, and Dr. Berner. Um, we've also got some wonderful, um, CNS representatives. We have Linda Gonzalez, um, who's the director of Tides. I think I saw some advice, CNS advisors. I see Norma. Um, I don't know. If there's any other advisors on the call, feel free to, to say hello. I think we've got a few. Um, so with that, let me kick off the presentation. Let me share my screen. One second. One second. There you go. Mm -hmm. Um, sorry. Screen, screen, screen. All right. Um, can everybody see my screen? Yeah. Okay, great. So I think the best place to start off is really just with the question, you know, why study abroad? Why have this experience? Um, and just to show you um, a quick uh, survey that was done recently from UT grads, over 85% said that uh, study abroad was, you know, one of the biggest impacts to their professional or graduate success, and it was ranked higher than any other campus activity. Um, you know, studying abroad provides you with another way of looking at things. It presents you with new challenges, new risks, and by navigating those challenges and risks, um, you are going to learn more about yourself, more about the world, and more about bridging differences. So in short, it makes you a better person. Um, this is just a quick snapshot of um, some stats. So we send uh, a lot of students abroad every year. Obviously, uh, COVID-19 and this global pandemic has slowed down um, the number of participants we have. Uh, but we have had students abroad this fall semester, students are abroad this spring semester, and we anticipate um, students abroad in the summer as well. Um, we are monitoring the situation worldwide and working behind the scenes to make sure that if you want to have this opportunity that you have options. Um, normally we send over 4,400 students abroad each year. We've got over 100 countries that you can go to and over 400 types of different programs. Um, so whether it's this year or next year, we're confident uh, that there is a program for you if you plan for it. So this is a quick um, chart that just shows you a few of the program types. So I'm going to give a high level overview and we're going to be highlighting um, specific programs within each of these categories as it relates to CNS. So um, first of all, an exchange program. These are programs where UT has a direct relationship with a host university. Um, so our students go there and their students come here. So um, it, these types of programs are very independent. Um, you kind of get involved in your own student orgs, so you find your way around. Um, the international office there is uh, there to help you. Um, you do pay UT tuition and your grades are transferred back to UT and all the credit you get is in residence. Um, an affiliate program, on the other hand, is where UT is partnering with um, a study abroad company or a third party provider. And so these programs look a little bit different. Um, there's lots of different affiliate programs. Um, they're generally a little bit more uh, supportive in the sense that, um, you know, they've got staff uh, abroad and you're going with a cohort of other US students. 
Um, they provide excursions that are built into the program, you know, orientation, um, things like that. Um, Credit-wise, these come back as transfer credit. Uh, so the grades that you get on these programs do not factor into your GPA. Um, we also have faculty-led programs. These are programs where you're going abroad with UT faculty, you're getting um, a UT course taught abroad, and you're going just with a cohort of UT students. So it's just like taking a course that you would have taken here abroad. Um, the grades are in residence and they transfer back to your GPA. Um, finally, you'll see that internships kind of spans um, exchange and affiliate. So um, more on that uh, later in the presentation. Um, and I'm going to skip to this slide. Um, so typically we get questions that fall into two big buckets. Um, they're in regards to, to funding and credit. Um, and these kind of fall in line with some of the bigger myths about education abroad. You know, one that it's too expensive or it's going to delay your graduation. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about each of these. Um, in terms of funding, um, just know that the real cost of studying abroad can actually be more affordable than the cost of a semester at UT. Um, especially like if you went on an exchange program, um, but you're going to a location with a lower cost of living than UT. Secondly, um, if you receive financial aid here at UT, it does travel with you. And then third, um, there are over $1 million of scholarships that our office gives out each year. And there's also lots of national scholarships that you can apply for. Um, and then in terms of credit, um, do know that if you go on an approved program, you are guaranteed some kind of credit and we're gonna work with you to have it meet your degree requirements. Um, we also have a credit database um, with thousands of records that tracks all the courses students have taken abroad. Um, so that's a resource for you to, um, to look through. And um, third, we do have an evaluation process as well, um, either before you go or after you return to get um, courses that you take abroad, um, um, finding those correct equivalencies um, for that. So with that, um, I'm going to pass it off to my colleague, Joshua. Um, he's going to uh, highlight some exchange and affiliate programs um, specifically for CNS or good fits for CNS majors. So Thank you, Jane. Um, first of all, it's so exciting to see so many of you here. I think since we started doing these virtual information sessions, this is by far the biggest group I've seen. So thank you for being here. It's really exciting. Um, I am going to be talking about our exchange and affiliate programs today. And I'll just start out by saying that our exchange and affiliate programs are really good for what, for people who might consider themselves like intrepid explorers because um, you are in a single place for at least one semester. So you really have an opportunity to experience the culture um, and the climate of a place in depth. Um, so if you're looking for that kind of really long-term immersed experience, these programs are gonna be good fits for you. Um, the programs, especially the exchanges allow you to be more independent and really customize the kind of coursework and involvement that you have. So um, for those who are looking for a lot of flexibility in their, their study abroad program, um, the exchange programs are particularly a good fit. Um, today, I'm just gonna be highlighting a quick small, small selection of our overall portfolio of exchange programs. Um, the ones I'm gonna be talking about today are, are those programs that we think could be a particularly good fit for CNS students. It's by no means the only courses or the only programs that, that could work for a CNS student, but it's just those that we think um, are particularly worth highlighting. Um, and as we've already mentioned, I'll, I'll touch at the very end of my slides about um, our, our advising process and kind of how you can explore further from here. So, uh, we will start out in Singapore and the National University of Singapore. So I know later in this presentation, we're actually going to be having a professor talk about their uh, faculty-led program in Singapore. So I won't go into too much detail about Singapore, the city, other than to say that I highly recommend it. I've been there many times. It's super safe, ultra modern, as you can see from this photo. Um, it's relatively low cost. Um, 
English is widely spoken. And if you're interested in exploring the rest of that part of the world, um, Southeast Asia, it's a great hub for exploration, low cost flights, things like that. Um, the program itself, um, NUS is often ranked the number one university in Asia and top 20 overall globally. Uh, it has a wide breadth of coursework and good, particularly good matches for CNS students in the past have been in bio, computer science, uh, mathematics, and physics, just to name a few. So if any of those fields match with what you're looking for, NUS is definitely worth checking out. Moving on pretty much to the complete opposite side of the world to the UK. We have a couple of programs in the UK. The first one I will highlight is the University of Bristol. Um, University of Bristol is very highly ranked. It's considered, often considered Ivy League level. I think you're on mute. Sorry, I accentally muted him. <laughs> uh, when Sorry. when did you when did I get muted? Was I still no. talking about Singapore? No, 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 no. Like five seconds. Sorry, Josh. Okay, no problem. No problem. I'll keep going with the University of Bristol. So it's considered Ivy League level. It has bio, computer science, mathematics courses. Um, it's known for its like street art and underground music scene and Though it's on the opposite side of England, England's not that big. It's really only about a 90 minute train ride from London. Uh, and it's often been voted like the most desirable location, most desirable city to live in the UK. So if you're interested in England, check out University of Bristol. Um, moving to the next slide further north to Scotland and University of Edinburgh. Uh, also has good CNS course availability in biochem, bio, computer science, um, but differently than some of the other programs I've highlighted, there's also good ge um, geology coursework um, and physics. It's a, a world heritage site, the city of Edinburgh itself, uh, has, always has good annual festivals. It's very cosmopolitan, um, an excellent transport network and moderate climate considering how far north it is. Uh, and it's, again, it's very highly ranked. Like I, I really don't have to keep saying that pretty much all of the programs I'm highlighting here are top 30 to 40 in the world. Um, so if you're looking for a high level CNS coursework, that definitely University of Edinburgh could be another good exchange option. Okay, moving on. All right, moving to Scandinavia, we have Sweden and Uppsala University. Um, only about an hour by train to Stockholm, about, about an hour north, I believe. Um, really beautiful university. You can see it's a really picturesque town in this photo. Bio, computer science, chemistry, and mathematics are all good options for here. Um, it's known for having a really unique and fun student life. Uh, there's a student nations, like international student program there that we've heard good things about. So if you're interested in Scandinavia, definitely Sweden is one of the places that we most often recommend to students. Okay, moving back way over to the other side of the world, down to Australia. Um, all of the five programs listed here are classified as premier partners with CNS. So these are schools that have basically been vetted as being particularly good for all CNS students. Um, because there's five programs here, I, I don't really have time to go into depth about all of them. So I'm just going to keep it fairly surface level and say if you are considering Oceania, Australia, you're going to have an abundance of choices. Um, and these are spread between a bunch of different cities, uh, Melbourne, Sydney, Canberra, and Brisbane. So if you want to learn more about uh, our Australia options, come to one of our Q and A's that I will highlight in a few minutes. Okay, the last few slides, uh, I'm going to be going over some of our affiliate options. So as mentioned before, these are also usually semester length programs, but they're a little bit more pre-planned, a little bit less 
options in terms of coursework, but they can also be very attractive because they're more specialized and it'll allow you to do more kind of a, a niche program that is really drilling down into something that you might have particular interest in. So for example, this these SIT programs, which are in a really wide range of countries, and a lot of these countries are not places where we have exchange programs or many other programs at all. So if you might be interested in one of these countries, definitely check out these programs. Um, these programs in particular focus on ecology, biodiversity, and conservation. So if any of those are things that you might be interested in, check out SIT. SIT is known really for being a, a global leader in these kind of like independent type research programs. And they have a, a model completely built around that kind of program. So if that sounds like something you might be interested in, definitely check out SIT. Moving back over to London, we have this life science career accelerator program, which is unique in that it has it's unique in our programs in that it kind of has a career component built into it. Um, the, the core class that everyone will take on this program um, is an overview of like, the business of life science from innovation to commercialization. Um, it has an optional internship component. So it's very career focused. So if that's something that you might be looking for from your experience abroad. We highly recommend this course. It's also a very new program. So we haven't had a lot of student feedback on it, but from what we've been seeing from the literature and what they've been sharing with us, it looks like a really exciting new option. Uh, there's also kind of elective courses in bioinformatics, epidemiology and global public health. So if any of those things are fields where you might be interested in combining with your study abroad experience, this could be a good fit for you. And the final affiliate program I'm going to touch on is the Budapest semester in mathematics. Um, some of you may know this, I did not know this, but Hungary has a really long tradition of excellence in mathematics education. So it's kind of a natural fit that this program is in Hungary. Um, it's obviously caters mostly to mathematics students, but also um, computer science majors uh, can find coursework there. Uh, it's unique in that it has a lot of small courses and they're mainly taught really by eminent Hungarian scholar teachers. So it's something that kind of, uh, gives you an opportunity to study this field in a way that probably no other program would. Um, it's also based in Budapest, which is considered one of the most livable cities in the world. Cost of living, living is very low, lower than Austin for sure. Um, and yeah, it's not as touristy as some of the other main cities in Central Europe. Uh, it also has an intensive language course. If anyone is interested in picking up the local language, you can arrive a few weeks early before the term starts um, and, and pick up a language while you're there. So those are all the programs that I'm going to touch on today. Uh, before I pass it on, I just want to go really quickly kind of over how our advising flow is going to work for these programs. So. We, the first thing we do is we ask um, all students to re do their research ahead of time and watch the advising videos that we have posted on our website. We have, we have videos posted for each uh, region around the world. So if one of these programs caught your interest, let's say Australia, we have a regional advising video already recorded for Australia. You can go in and check that out and get some more depth on the programs. Um, if you have questions after that, you can then go to one of our live Q&A sessions that we have scheduled every week, uh, Monday and Tuesday, they're focusing on our exchange programs and Wednesday, they're focusing on our affiliate programs. Uh, those are every day at noon. We also have a more general education abroad 101 Q&A on Tuesdays at 11 a.m. Those are great opportunities to come in and ask direct questions to program coordinators like myself um, who can answer your question or guide you to the person or place that would best be able to answer a question for you. Beyond that, we encourage everyone to continue researching on our website. There's a lot of different ways to search programs, whether it be by country, language, or academic field. Um, you can check out MICA, which is the My Credit Abroad database, where you can see what students have taken in the past at specific 
um, exchange programs or affiliate programs and see what you, specific UT credit that course was matched to. So let's say you have a course that you really need to complete your major requirements. You can go in and see what programs around the world maybe have had a student who have previously gone and found a class that was an exact equivalent match for that. Um, finally, we, we have a few checklists that we encourage students to, to look at, to use as goals, um, guidelines, things to think about throughout the process. And finally, if none of that is, is, um, is meeting your needs, you can always email us directly at the Education Abroad web uh, email listed here, and we will get back to you that way. So that's going to wrap up my part of the presentation today, and I will pass it back to Jean. Thanks so much, Josh. That was great. I loved the, the uh, travel around the world with that one. Um, we're going to switch gears and talk a little bit about faculty-led programs now. And um, just to kick this section off, um, uh, faculty-led programs, again, they're just like what they sound like. They are study abroad programs uh, led by UT professors. You'll go with a cohort of 15 to 30 UT students. Um, and faculty will teach, um, teach a course and supplement the course with very tailored activities and resources. One second. There we go, I'm back. Um, uh, let's see, these are shorter term programs. So the May masters are three to four weeks and three to four credits. Summer programs are six to 12 weeks and six to 12 credits. Um, we, for this year, we've got many programs open. Um, the deadlines are coming up in early to mid February. Um, so you're about to hear from some uh, awesome faculty leaders that are, uh, we're hopeful um, can run this summer. Um, to learn more, you can check out our events calendar if you want to attend a program specific um, info session. Um, I did want to mention um, something quite important um, for us this year. Uh, faculty led programs work a little bit different from other programs. And because of that, um, we're doing, um, you know, uh, assessments and we've decided um, what we're calling this go no go decision date of March 12th. Um, so we're having ongoing checkpoints to like COVID, health and safety assessments. Um, and on this date, uh, we will be uh, kind of making the final decision and communicating to students if a program will be running in country or not, or if it um, uh, has to be canceled this year. Um, do note that if uh, we do cancel, if you're applying to a May master or summer program this year, um, and we cancel it prior to departure, you will get a full refund on any deposits that you might have paid or program fees. Um, so I just wanted to, to highlight that because that is definitely something uh, different for this year. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand it off to some of our faculty leaders um, here. They're going to give you a quick like teaser um, about their program and what it looks like. Again, these programs are slated to run this summer. Um, and so we will get a new batch of uh, faculty led programs um, for next year. And some of these might um, uh, be on the docket for next year as well. So with that, um, we're starting in Costa Rica with uh, professors Buskirk and Hansen. So you can go ahead and unmute and take it away. Hi, I'm Ruth Buskirk and I want to introduce my co-instructor, Deborah Hansen. Deborah, if you could wave or say hi, that'd be great. Uh, we teach a Maymester, a, a four-week Maymester in Costa Rica. It's called Land Use Issues because we're studying rainforest conservation, but in the context of lots of different issues of, of land use in Costa Rica. And, and next slide. Um, Costa Rica is, um, thank you. Um, Costa Rica is a small country, um, tropical country, but it has such a great variety of habitats and we move around the country. Uh, we don't sit in one spot, we visit many different sites. So we're visiting uh, national parks, we're visiting reserves, we're visiting farms, we're visiting um, um, heritage sites and the habitats are amazing. So you can see there's a, a line of mountains down the middle of the country uh, and we have dry forests and montane cloud forests. And so it's a very rich uh, tropical environment. And there's a diverse history of 
agricultural tr traditions there, and we do study the agricultural as, as well. Of course, Costa Rica is an amazing uh, tourism site, especially now ecotourism, and we end up studying that as well in this interdisciplinary course. Uh, next slide. So Costa Rica has, as I said, many um, beautiful and diverse tropical forests. Um, the, the, some parts of the country have get um, four meters of rainfall, meters of rainfall, that's a lot, uh, but it's not evenly distributed. So some parts of the country are dry and support different kinds of forests. Um, and there's a, uh, um, so one of the things we're looking at is different forest types and how that affects the agricultural use in the area too. Uh, next slide. So <laughs> Costa Rica has amazing biodiversity and we will see all of these animals and more uh, in our Maymester. So it's particularly rich in bird life and insects, but we also see a lot of reptiles and amphibians and great mammal diversity. And we see some snakes too as well. Um, we have a variety of the people on the Maymester are um, quite a variety. It's quite an interdisciplinary group from, we have some plan to liberal arts majors. We have environmental science majors. We have uh, pre-meds. Uh, we have a, a great diversity and some, we have some people interested in ecology. Um, next slide. So our study is we're trying to figure out what's going on with the land use in Costa Rica. And Costa Rica has been exemplary in protecting its land uh, in the last few decades. Already over a quarter of the land is in some type of protected area, um, national parks or reserves. And even more is um, semi-regulated or development is controlled in a system of conservation areas. Plus, Costa Rica has a lot of diverse energy strategies, and uh, especially with geothermal and wind energy, and vows to become carbon neutral soon. In addition, we visit a lot of farms and we learn about um, new sustainable agricultural practices. And so there's a diversity of experiences that our students get by visit in our, in our course. Uh, next slide. We visit a lot of different habitats. What can I say? We go to some nice beaches, yes, but this is not a vacation. We're actually studying. Uh, we see some gorgeous forests uh, and we also visit it. Uh, we, we see different types of farming areas as too. Uh, next slide. So this is a really, team base. A lot of our work is collaborative. Um, we'll do some individual research and some group work, um, but the team, the course, stay, the, the people in the course stay together. It's not like you'll have weekends off on your own. We moved, uh, we move around the country together. Um, next slide. <clears throat> Yeah, we stay in luxurious five-star hotels, not, uh, but we are um, comfortable and set up in research stations and uh, we travel between sites in a charter bus, very safe bus. This course, we are outdoors a lot and we also do a lot of walking. Next slide. So here's, I think the most valuable part of this course. We talk with Costa Ricans, we talk with farmers, researchers, we get to meet local community leaders who tell us about their economic issues, uh, the cultural variety of people we meet is wonderful, but all of them are very proud of their country and very eager, um, very interested in conservation. So the best part of the course, I think, is to that we get to meet all these people. Uh, our course is in English, but these wonderful people either trans, we have translators or they speak to us, but we meet the people. And next slide. So um, I just wanted to invite you to participate in this interdisciplinary course. Um, and it will be offered for four weeks. Um, and I think that's the last slide. Yes. Thank okay. You so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks.
All right. Uh, next up, we're traveling from Costa Rica to Singapore. So if Dr. Sata, you want to take over. Hi, do you hear me and you, do you see me? Yes. Okay, excellent. Um, yeah, thank you for the opportunity and uh, thanks to all the students uh, interested to learn more about this. Wonderful to hear about Costa Rica from you know, Dr. Buskirk and uh, Singapore is on the other end, even though it is also on the equator. Um, and uh, go to the next slide, please. And uh, this is the course Bio 337 Global Sustainability and Renewable Resources. It's a three credit course. Uh, spread over four weeks in Singapore in an immersive learning. And it also has a writing flag. And if some of you are keeping up with the news that we are uh, uh, losing 1.2 trillion tons of uh, glacier ice melting every year. And, and so global warming is real and has been happening and the impact is, feel, is felt worldwide. And this course puts a focus on this. So this is the first time we are offering this course in Singapore, even though like the early introduction said, the National University of Singapore has uh, uh, been a, one of the partners with the UT Austin for study abroad program. Um, next slide, please. And why Singapore? Singapore is uh, one of the best countries in the world, even though it is very small, 5.3 million is size of Houston, are the suburb, including the suburbs. And it's also 255 square miles in about 64 islands. You can think of it like, you know, 25 mile wide and 10 mile or long and 10 mile wide. That's Singapore within an hour or two, you can go from point A to point B. It's right at the tip of Malaysia. And uh, it, it's a great tropical island, you know, one of the best in the world in economy, education, as well as innovative energy use. And um, it's a very safe place to be. I have lived in Singapore for two years and uh, I have been there and you know, a lot of positive things about Singapore. And it's one of the, the democratic countries that's also very highly advanced in technology as well as um, in a diversity of culture. You will see you know, Chinese culture, Malay culture, Indian culture, and Western culture, like British people established colonies about 200 years. Next slide, please. So this is, you know, a central business district. The first week of the program, it gives an introduction to why do we need, you know, global sustainability and what are the importance of renewable resources, lays the foundation of the course. And we are going to give an so overview tour of Singapore this is the skyline view of Central Business District. Is I used to work in one of those buildings called Raffles Place on the CBD Central Business District. Then we went to an Orchard Road for another year. I used to work for a multinational company there. And after, during this time, we will also you know, um, learn about Singapore. They will introduce to the diversity in culture and the different languages, the four different official languages spoken in there, uh, Malay, uh, Mandarin, English, and Tamil. That's, it's, it's my mother tongue. So it, it's very friendly and everyone speaks English and very uh, dynamic uh, city. And we will be staying in a, a fully furnished and service apartments is the plan to stay in the center of the island. So it's easy to commute. And commuting there also, it's fairly easy and straightforward. So it is, uh, and we are going to have a structured program of Monday through Thursday with the course structure of discussion and learning. And then evenings and the weekends, we will have free time to move around and learn. And on every Friday, day, we will have a structured tour starting in the morning and until the evening. That's when we have a guided tour we go and visit places. And one of the days during the week, we will also have a guest lecture from Singapore who work on these renewable resources. Come and give a talk. Next slide, please. So the second week we talk about the, you know, the water resources. Singapore does not have any natural water, but it has desalinization plants and also new water facility. 
And this is, a, you know, Singapore airport, the Changi airport. And uh, you know, the people are very tiny over here. You can see that creating this tropical ecosystem within a, you know, a modern city is the beauty of Singapore. And it, it's a very affordable, uh, not, I wouldn't say for the program wise, but Singapore is an expensive city, just like Austin is an expensive city, but it's, it's very user friendly. People are very friendly and navigation, everything is easy. So here we will learn about how they are supplying water. It is a close to circuit system where every water that turns out of the tap is collected and treated and reused. Uh, and this water is, you know, portable water. So that is something that we will learn on. Next slide, please. In the third week, we talk about the energy utilization and uh, the, you know, they have mostly um, you know, fossil source energy, but they are also one of the top in the research in renewable energy. And during this time, we will visit the Energy Sciences Institute in Singapore and uh, Sentosa Island. So this is again a recreational island created and we have a walk through tropical forest. It's not as, you know, like it is real forest, but it's done in a very, uh, uh, you know, easy to navigate manner. And so you can not only have this, you know, um, cars like fly on at the top of the rail, uh, monorails, as well as we can also walk on top of the tropical forest and we can see the different diversity in the ecosystem. And uh, so we will look at alternative energy such as solar, wind, as well as other alternative energies like hydroelectric. I'm not sure we will have an opportunity to visit uh, Malaysia, which is nearby, but at least we will see that Johar Bahru, the Northern end, and uh, depending on the time, and I would be arranging different tours in, in that area. Next, please. Then this is the last week of uh, the uh, you know to, it, the study there, and we are focusing on land utilization. And all you see that on the red in the map is they all reclaimed land from the ocean, so they have filled the ocean and they brought new land because they have a land limited uh, you know country and they have vertical growth in there. And we will also look at Jurong Bird Park. This is the largest uh, atrium in the world, if I can think of. And this is one of the best bird park and contain all the different birds of tropical uh, as well as subtropical regions. And as a bonus to this tour in not only learning about um, the renewable resources in terms of the water, uh, energy and the land, we will also understand how, we will also be visiting a botanical garden. This is one of the oldest botanical gardens in the world established by British people. And we will visit the bird park to see how they will blend flora and fauna in a modern society and have a sustainable ecosystem. And as a bonus for anyone interested in, in a medical area, healthcare, human sustainability, we will be visiting a local hospital and see how they manage there. Okay, so that is uh, the overall view. The students are in any majors uh, are uh, accepted. And um, so we will start with the very basic and bring everybody in engineering, biology, liberal arts, and anyone interested in ecology um, and sustainability are welcome. And um, the, the students, most of them will be uh, individual work there will also be group presentations and there'll be two major reports to write. Okay, that's all I have. And uh, you can move on to the next one, Jean. Hey, thanks so much, Dr. Sata. Um, next up is Dr. Phelps's program in Santander. Um, Dr. Phelps, I gave you co-host. So I think you, if you have slides, you can share those. You should be able to share your screen too. Great, thank you. I'll go ahead and... Uh, <clears throat> okay, let me stop I'll, mine. I'll go ahead and... Uh, um, sorry, I need to expand for a moment. Start my video so you can see me. Great. So uh, you can see here behind me, uh, not the uh, walls of my home where I am speaking, but a beach in Santander, Spain. And this is uh, the place where our... Um, our study abroad program will be. So I'll go ahead and uh, show you here where we are. Okay. 
And uh, so I, I'll have a series. I've got a few more intercessions left. And uh, if you're curious for more details about the program, uh, you can go to the Texas Global site. I also have my own uh, website for the program, phelpslab.net slash study abroad. Um, or if you just remember phelpslab.net, you can go and, and poke around and find it. And uh, this is uh, currently scheduled for summer one. And uh, basically I, I'm an instructor, here. I'm a professor here at, at UT and I've been here for a little over a decade. And for a number of years now I've taught human biology. Um, and uh, it kind of brings together different major themes in biology. It's a four majors class that counts for a variety of CNS requirements. If you're a biology major, it uh, counts toward the ecology and evolution credit for uh, many of the majors in biology and um, it counts for advanced hours credit and uh, um, carries a global cultures flag among other things. Um, and my program then also is paired with a Spanish class and we're uh, currently offering three different Spanish classes for a variety of skill levels, including, um, including uh, introductory level that assumes no prior knowledge of Spanish and uh, advanced level, including uh, a class on uh, Spanish for healthcare professionals. And so you'll take my class plus one of these Spanish classes, stay with a host family uh, in uh, Santander and go on a number of excursions uh, in and around Northern Spain. So the class overall and the program overall is kind of, it's for biology majors and, or, or for science majors, but particularly for biology majors. And uh, I view the class as kind of a, a integration or a capstone class that brings together major ideas in biology that maybe you haven't seen together in the same class and uses humans as examples. And then in the study abroad version, we anchor that in lots of really interesting local culture and local sites. Uh, and we see a few of those highlights below. So first of all, the site of the, uh, of the study abroad program is in Santander, Spain. And you can see here down, down here that's really very much on the coast. It's on the northernmost edge of Spain. And this is just one of many beautiful pictures you can see of Santander. Santander is a city of about 180,000 people. And we do this uh, in collaboration with people from the University of Cantabria. This has been a long standing site for hosting study abroad programs. They have an existing homestay program that we've used for many years. The city is very safe, very pleasant, and it's, it's quite beautiful. The average high in the month of June is 71. When, if we arrive in May, it'll be a little cooler than that, but it's just a, a really gorgeous site. A uh, lovely city with some interesting architecture, some interesting museums, this is an art museum, um, and the city right on the coast. Um, and it's just been a wonderful place to host our program. And then um, because it's on the coast, you can see little people here. This is the view from a restaurant just on the edge of Santander. That's one of my favorite places. And just the, the, the whole northern coast is spectacular and there are surprisingly few tourists uh, overall. So you get a really authentic, really wonderful experience. My uh, coursework tries to uh, anchor uh, major topics, epigenetics, genetics, and evolution uh, to the site. And so, for example, thinking about genetics, we might, we might study uh, genome-wide association studies and polygenic risk scores, if those ideas mean anything to you. Um, and then we might also anchor that to the historical movements of people on, this, on the Iberian Peninsula and how that relates to language diversity, how it relates to genetic diversity, and how it relates to the deep uh, cultural history um, of the people uh, of, the, of the Spanish Peninsula. We're gonna go visit some caves where there are cave art. There's cave art that's so old that uh, researchers debate whether it's made by Neanderthals or, uh, or modern humans. And so we'll see cave art that's 40,000 years old uh, on one of, our, uh, one of our trips. In fact, there are 18 different UNESCO World Heritage Sites with Paleolithic art, art within about an hour or so um, from, uh, from Santander. And we'll, we'll go to a few of those on one of our excursions. Another excursion is to a very famous fossil dig about two hours south of Santander called Arapuerca outside the city of Burgos. And there's a huge famous cathedral in Burgos, but there's also a fossil dig and a museum of human evolution, which is the site of um, the earliest known uh, homo fossils within Europe um, and uh, homo antecessor shown here in a reconstruction on your left. So we'll go to the site and visit the museum. And one of the things we'll do is go to a place where they have lots of interactive exhibits that kind of show you where you get to see the fossils firsthand. These are some of my students from last time. Uh, you learn how to uh, use a spear thrower and how to uh, nap flint uh, to make a, a stone axe, if you like. It's just a, a really, really fun trip. 
Our third excursion is to Madrid, which is a, a long weekend trip um, where we'll go to the Museum, uh, National Museum of Natural Sciences and understand how aspects of our body trace back in time, um, whether it's the design of our limbs or the origins of our cell structure. And we'll take advantage of museums there uh, to inform that. Also the National Museum of Archaeology. And, um, and then in the process, we'll kind of get a, a big picture view of how, how our body relates to our evolutionary history, to our genetics, uh, and to all of these, and, and to, to cultural variation as well. And anyway, it's been just a really fantastic program so far. And these are uh, my students on our way back from Madrid near the end of the class. Um, and we just had a lovely time sort of visiting different sites in Spain and incorporating that into our, our biology classroom. I'll stop there. Thanks so much, Dr. Phelps. Um, and our last faculty-led presenter will be Dr. Berner. Um, one sec, let me give you co-host. Um, he's got a program this summer to Sevilla, Spain. So give me one. You can go ahead and unmute Dr. Berner and I'll give you control shortly. Um, I need the screen share. Okay, one second. There we go. You should be co-host now. Okay. What? All this newfangled stuff. I don't know why that's not sharing my screen here. Oh, uh, let me try it. I might have to have you do the presentation. I've never had this problem before. No problem. Let me pull it up. You can go ahead and start talking. I, I do think I have a copy of your slides. Um, yeah, I think you do. Okay, well, let's do that. Okay. I was going to control it because I have so many slides, but I'll be going like slide, 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 slide. Okay, I'm pulling up one second. In the meantime, I like to say uh, hi to my uh, colleagues in natural sciences. It's nice to see you, Sata and Ruth and Deborah and Steve. Thank you. That's the end of my, that's the my original, pre there we go. Okay, go ahead if you will. So my, uh, my program is, and a uh, slide please. Um, uh, that's, that's my long presentation. That's not my short presentation that I sent along. Sorry, Dr. Berner, I don't think I have a copy of your short one. I, this is the long one. Do you want me to jump to your photos or? I'll uh, just keep going. We'll go through. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I sent along a shorter one. Okay, so anyhow, this is evolution and international and cultural perspective. And uh, like um, uh, Dr. Phelps' course, mine has two, a program. I have two. It's Bio 370 Evolution, which I teach. And there's also a Spanish culture class that uh, you take. And that can count for credit for the, you need six hours total of foreign language or culture. And this is approved for three of those hours. Slide, please. Okay, so I'm Mark Berner and uh, my students usually call me Dr. B. I'm also called El Marco by a few uh, closer friends. Next. Uh, so uh, this is about the, cult the cultural class and that's gonna be taught uh, by a professor at the University of Sevilla. And um, this, this is a hybrid program because that will be, while mine is a residence course, this is a course that will transfer credit. Next, please. And one thing I want to talk about uh, is that we're going to look at how different parts of different parts of Spain are. Next. Uh, next. 
I'm going to run through some of these because there's a lot more. I took a lot of these slides out. Next. Next. You can tell from all of this, there's been a lot of activity in Spain. I wanted to show you this, though. Uh, why are some regions of Spain so darn different from one another? We'll also talk about Spain from the perspective, modern perspective of what's its position in the EU, what are its politics and things like that. If you'll take a look up there where it says Kingdom of Aragon. OK, so this is the time of Ferdinand and Isabella. So just looking at that, next slide. Notice that Aragon, Valencia, and Catalonia are all in that area. And what do they speak in Catalonia in addition to Spanish? They speak Catalan. And there are variations of Catalan in Aragon and Valencia as well. So that entire region is really quite different from the rest of Spain. So with that in mind, so that explains why modern Spain has these major differences. Next. So this, um, for Biology 370, what we want to do is take a look at uh, what's going on in the Iberian Peninsula as far as evolution is concerned. You notice that this is a peninsula and it's cut off from the rest of the Europe, Europe by the Pyrenees. So that sets up some great interesting evolutionary situations, such as endemism, because things have been trapped in this peninsula for a long time. So we can look at that. We'll look at endemic flora, endemic fauna, and we'll also look at the genetics of artificial selection with reference to domesticated animals such as Andalusian horses, uh, Spanish fighting bulls, by the way, genetically traced to North Africa. Next. Uh, also, things like Iberian black pigs. Next. Which gets into a cultural aspect of Spain, such as Hamon Iberico. And next. Amon Serrano is from the white pigs there. Uh, we'll look at plants that are important to Spanish culture. And I will talk a fair amount about uh, uh, artificial selection, which is how Darwin made his connection of natural selection with people, because people understood artificial selection. They could see it all around them in the flower shops, in the markets, in the vegetable markets, and so forth. So we'll talk about plants that are important to Spanish culture and society next. And things like uh, olives, you know, all those olives that you see in the grocery store? Hey, there's one species of olive. Okay, so we have, and then grapes, yeah, there's several species of grapes, but Vitus vinifera is the main wine grape. And we'll talk about grapes and we'll also talk about what you make out of grapes. Next, a quick tour. We start in Madrid, we'll be there for four nights. Next. And we'll go to really important cultural sites like the Museum of Ham, where we will, you know, and uh, well, the, you know, it's not a museum. It's where you go to have a few brewskis and a plate of pig. And next, it will have uh, chocolate and churros. Nothing says loving like fried dough. And uh, next, we'll go to the Royal Botanical Garden. Next. Uh, we'll go to the Prado. Going to Spain, to Madrid, and not going to the Prado would be like going to Paris and not going to the Louvre. So we have a guided tour there, and then we'll take next. We'll go to uh, take a uh, uh, a hike in the Sierra Guadarrama, which is north of Madrid. Next, and if I can do it, you can do it. Next. <laughs> Uh, some free time. There's the Archaeological Museum, which was uh, mentioned by Dr. Phelps. I think they go there as part of their program. Uh, we used to. I could do some other things now. Next. Uh, you might want to go to the Royal Palace. Next. Uh, go to the Reina Sofia Museum. If you want to see modern art, if you want to see Picasso, you want to see Dali and things like that, you need to go to Reina Sofia. That is not uh, that's after the cutoff date for the Prado. Next, uh, El Retiro Park is just on the other side of the of the uh, Prado. On to Sevilla. So we'll stop on the way and we'll stop in Cordoba and see the mosque there next. 
So a lot of the, uh, we'll be in Andalusia, which is in the south of Spain. And so there's a lot of Muslim influence there. There was Muslim occupation from 711 to 1492. And there was Roman occupation. So there's a lot of Roman ruins as well. Next, we'll go on to Sevilla. And this is just a view to where uh, I used to have my apartment on the left-hand side up toward the top. And that the view that you see on the right, that was the view from my apartment to the, uh, to the cathedral there. What you're seeing is the Geralda. It's the old minaret because that started off as a mosque. Next. And then, you know, really important cultural sites like my favorite Tapa Bar. Next and some of my friends at the top of bar. Next, that I've known for years. Uh, we'll go to Parque, Parque Maria Luisa Plaza España next. And you know, you never know who you might run into there next. Uh, the cathedral, the uh, Seville Cathedral is amazing. It's the largest Gothic style cathedral in the world, next. Uh, we'll take another hike. We'll go to Sierra Grata Lima, which is high, has a very high rainfall, particularly for the south of Spain, and has endemic species. We'll take a nice walk there next. That's just my class, part of my class from one year. Next. Uh, this is Alcazar and Sevilla. Next. We have a lot of activities. We have about 15 different activities. Uh, we'll also go to, this is the um, um, uh, Developmental Biology Institute, and we'll have a lecture there on uh, Evo Devo, the connection of evolution and development. We'll have a lecture here at Stacion Biologia de Daniana and El Marco with his bird. Next. Ah, and you know, since we're learning about grapes and what you make out of them, Andalusia is the home of Sherry. It's so, all oh, strictly educational, you understand, that we must, simply must go to a bodega and uh, learn about sherry next. And then we'll go on to Cadiz, which is the oldest uh, continually uh, inhabited city in Europe, and we'll have a tour there. And then again, strictly educational, you'll have the afternoon at the beach, you know, unlike uh, who was it that said earlier about going to the beach as part of the program? Yeah, this is too. Next, <laughs> this could be you, next. Uh, we'll have a paella class as well, next. Uh, on your own, you might want to go to the bullfights. You might not want to. Next, uh, you know, if you get lucky, you might see you know something really good at the bullfight. Uh, there's all kinds of concerts. This is the Janes. Four of the five women are named Jane. Uh, the Triana Market. The markets are wonderful. Next, all kinds of things. Farewell dinner. Next. So many topics and tapas, so little time. Uh, go to Spain with me, you'll have a good time. Thank you so much for your attention. Thanks so much, Dr. Berner. Um, let me go ahead and pass the last section off to Kate, who's gonna talk about internships abroad. Um, Kate, feel free to start talking and I will pull up the slides. Cool. Um, hi. It's Great to talk to you. I've been in the chat this whole time. Um, excellent questions, everyone. Um, I'm Kate. I'm the International Internship Coordinator for Texas Global. Um, why intern abroad? You know that an internship is a great experience, um, but interning abroad adds additional value. It's a great way to see how your career and field changes in a different country. Um, what does health look like in a country with uh, national health care, for example? Um, it's a great way to learn how to communicate with people different from yourself, because even if you don't work abroad in the future, you will work with people different from yourself. It's a way to work on your hard skills. Those are some of the things you're learning in your classes. Also your transferable skills, your adaptability, your teamwork. Um, it's, those are the things that are going to be really important in getting your first job. You can establish your professional network. It doesn't mean you have to work abroad, but it is it opens opportunities for you, people who may know someone who knows someone in Houston, for example. And then it's a great way to bring unique anecdotes to your job search. Um, only about 10% of US college students study abroad. Interning abroad is a very small percentage of that. 
the average recruiter spends 20 seconds looking at a resume. It breaks my heart every time I spend three hours updating one. Um, so when they look down a resume and they see internship in Thailand, they are just genuinely curious. They've probably never seen that on a resume before. They will ask you about it. Um, your job then is to make sure that you have you know, solid professional answers about your experience. We have over a hundred programs where you can do an internship abroad. Um, so, but there's everyone's slightly different. There are some generalizations I can tell you though. First of all is that all of our internships are internship programs. We're not a job board. We do not connect you directly to a company. We have an all-inclusive experience and the internship is part of that. Our internships are not paid. This is um, because of your visas. You don't have work authorization in that country um, and that gets complicated. Um, but we do have great scholarships that can help offset the cost of your internship abroad. Mo our placements go through a customized matching process. These are academic experiences and they're meant to strengthen your um, personal academic and professional growth. So you will meet with an advisor and you will talk about your previous experience, your qualifications and the skills that you wanna develop. And you will be matched with an internship based on meeting those goals. Um, the good thing about this is that you are not required to have any prior internship experience. You are matched with a company that knows that and values the experience you already have. It does mean though that you have less control over the company name. So I tell students, if you know the name of the company you want to intern with, go apply directly to them. We cannot match you with Disney Paris, go directly. Um, most of our companies tend to be smaller companies or startups. There are some multinational branches, um, but students tend to prefer the smaller experience. If there's only 20 people in the company, you get a much broader internship experience. You're a lot less boxed in and you may have lunch with the CEO once a week. Um, good opportunities to know that your work is actually having an immediate impact. Um, this is less work for applicants. Once you're accepted to the program, you are guaranteed an internship for which you are qualified in that country. So less sending in uh, resumes into the void. And our companies are vetted by our providers so that you know it is a legitimate operation. You are supported by UT throughout the entire progress, our process. Um, our partners provide visa support so that you are applying for the most valid visa for your experience. Um, housing is arranged. You don't have to find that on your own. There is 24 seven emergency support on the ground should you need it and you are covered by UT overseas insurance. So a lot of support that goes with this. Um, there are essentially three bucket types of internships. We have our internship programs with coursework. These are attached to the exchange and affiliate programs that um, my colleague talked about earlier. We also have internship programs without coursework. These are full-time 30 to 40 hour a week internship professional development experiences. They still have um, cultural activities and professional development activities built into the program, but you are not taking classes, you're not getting a grade. And then we have our new model, which are faculty driven internships. This is a small one um, built out from UT faculty's partnerships abroad. So over 100 programs, how do you pick? Uh, it's hard. Um, one place to start is I have flyers on our website of programs that are particularly suited to students interested in certain fields. This is not your major, so feel free to look at as many flyers as are interesting to you. Um, this is also not limiting, so this is a starting point. There may be other fantastic programs not on these flyers. They're actually not updated yet this spring, so definitely look broadly, but it's a great place to get an overview of you know, what options do exist. If a program has a language requirement that's listed, otherwise you are not required to speak any language except English. So don't feel like you have to limit yourself to an English only country. Next. Um, as I said, we have great scholarships to do an internship abroad. I have an entire funding for internships page where I list every scholarship I know of that works for an internship abroad. Um, so do look through it. I've got lots of buckets, as you can see on this page, to break it all down for you. Check it out. Um, but one key one to highlight is our Freeman Scholars Program. Um, this is one of the most generous scholarships in our office. We get a very generous, very big check, lots of zeros from the Freeman Foundation every year to support students doing internships in East or Southeast Asia. So if uh, money is important to you, think Asia. 
Um, the internship needs to be at least six weeks long. And when you come back, you do need to do a project where you share your experience with your UT community. Don't be scared of that project. I work with students to make that project fun. And a lot of students actually come and say that they enjoy that sharing experience. So don't be intimidated by that. Um, so your steps to apply. Uh, we've got virtual advising videos on our website. Check it out. Um, look at those web pages. They are updated as of first class day. So there's brand new information there. Check out those flyers. Um, I hold Internship Abroad 101 Q&A sessions um, every Tuesday. So you're welcome to come chat with me. Um, talk to your academic advisor, especially if you have an internship credit for your degree that you're trying to meet. And then when you apply, you are going to need to submit a resume. So you might as well go start talking to Career Services now about getting your resume updated. Um, if you have questions, the fastest way to get in contact with me is to email me, international.internships at austin.utexas.edu. I'm happy to help. Thanks so much, Kate. Um, I know we are over time. Um, this is the last slide. Um, uh, just links um, and we'll share out the slides um, and the recording for you all that links to some of the things we talked about. Um, I did want to just thank everyone for joining and sticking around. Um, I'm happy to stay on if there are additional questions. Um, but otherwise, thank you so much for for attending. Thanks, thank everyone. You. And again, I'm, I'm going to stay stick on for a little bit in case anybody else has questions. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Yeah. Thank you, Jim. Thanks. Uh, Kate, I actually was hoping I could ask you a question about the internships abroad. Um, I am looking into doing an internship for spring 2022. So that'd be next year. Um, and I'll have all my credits done by the end of fall. So I'm wondering, I, I talked a bit to my academic advisor about it. What does it look like um, kind of staying as a UT student for the benefit of working through UT for the spring versus just graduating and finding my own internship? Because I imagine that there's some benefits to kind of staying as a student. Um, that gets slightly complicated. Uh, we might want to talk offline about um, the pluses and minuses of that. You know, being supported by UT gives you all of the benefits if something goes wrong. Um, but if you have met all of your credit requirements, you are officially graduated, that can impact things like your financial aid um, and access to scholarships. So being a, even if you're a UT student, if you're no longer degree seeking, that that can have an impact. Um, we are, as a general rule, we are willing to support UT students the term after their graduation. So if you graduate in the fall, you know, we're willing to work with you abroad in the spring, but it can, you know, there, there are factors to be considered there. Awesome. Uh, and I actually shot you an email earlier today because I saw that I couldn't make that Tuesday 1230 time. So I'd love to talk offline uh, while I'm still here also. Good to see some of my former professors. Hi, Dr. Sada and Dr. Hansen. Hope y'all are well. Thank you all. Take care. Nice to see you too. Get back to your email. Appreciate it. Uh, I had a question as well. Y'all able to hear me? Yeah, yeah we ahead. can hear you. Yeah, um, so I actually found a program that I'm interested in. I'm interested in um, the, uh, uh, the uh, Edinburgh program. Um, and I mean, I'm, I was thinking about going like next, I guess, spring of next year. So a year from now, I mean, is it too early to think about that or anything like that? Cause I've looked into like the application stuff and I, I, I keep running into things that are like, uh, you can't self-authorize the application process for this and stuff like that. So I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm newly transferred, uh, from a different school and I'm just trying to figure out the process and how to, how it all works really. It's never too early to start planning. Um, and I'm glad that it sounds like you've narrowed it down to it is an, ex an exchange program in Scotland. Yeah, I mean, I was ho really hoping for, um, you know, the Scotland, the Scotland or uh, yeah, a full semester is what, is what you're asking, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, that was the idea like that, that Scotland or um, Ireland was cool too. Those are the two countries that are like kind of at the top of my list I'm looking at right now. Great. Joshua, do you want to um, 
Yeah, uh, I mean, like you said, it's never too early to start preparing. Uh, what, what, did you say you were interested in spring 22 or was it even later than that? Spring 22 is the one that I was looking at. I mean, like okay. uh, if I could speed up the process in any way, I could, that would be cool, but I don't think it's possible at this point. I think, cause I think both Limerick and Edinburgh have really early applications if I remember the video correctly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah so. um yeah so i mean it's never too early to start preparing if you want to join one of like those those q a calls that we have scheduled monday tuesdays uh, we can go over a little bit more about specific things that you could start preparing in terms of like essays or thinking about faculty that you might want to ask for references um and then we can go over how like the actual uh, authorization process works um to get the the application up and started but yeah i mean this point out where you're still about a year away from the semester starting, it is a little bit earlier than when most students would officially start their, their new application. But it doesn't mean you can't start preparing. Sure, sure. Uh, and as yeah. far as like uh, faculty recommendations, do they have to be UT faculty recommendations? Just again, because I haven't really developed those relationships yet. Yeah, we do ask that they're UT. Um, one of them can be um, a TA as well. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we do ask that they're, they're from UT. Okay. And yep. the calls that you said there, is that like on, is that on the, like the global website where it has like the links to like, like basically where I found this link? Exactly. Yeah. So okay, we're cool. at the bottom of the at a broad page where all the events are listed. You'll see the, those Q and A sessions listed. Okay. Perfect. Thank okay. you so much. You're welcome. And since you know that you need the recommendation already, cause you've been planning ahead so well, this is a great time to like start getting to know your faculty and making that extra effort. Well, uh, yeah, that was the idea. I mean, like uh, a lot of being being a STEM major and thinking about going into graduate school, it's already sort of, that's already been in the back of my head this whole time, but yeah. Perfect. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thanks again. I went, to, I went to Limerick, so I'm going to just give a small shout out to University of Limerick for being awesome. Okay. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I, 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 uh, I, I did like a, a Google uh, Maps tour of it. I don't know if you've ever done that where you just like drop the pin somewhere and just walk around, so to speak, like in quotations. Yeah, it was great. It looks beautiful city. I mean, Ireland in general, but yeah. And I and I spent, I, I lived for a month in Scotland, but I, I would love to live in Edinburgh for a very extended amount of time. Yeah. But thanks again, y'all. Thanks so much. Did anyone else have any questions? Going once. Going twice. <laughs> All right, well, we'll send out the slides and links. Um, thanks, thanks everyone for joining all on the call. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, bye. Bye, all. Bye, thanks.